By 1831, the people of Southampton were harboring plans for a practical link with the capital. The stagecoach service was slow, and an improved trade route would no doubt bring with it greater prosperity. First thoughts were for a canal from Spithead to London, but the tide was turning towards the latest transport revolution, the railway. 1830 had seen the opening of the first steam-powered passenger and freight railway between Manchester and Liverpool. It was just four years later that the London and Southampton Railway Bill was approved. The Southampton promoters hired W.J. Chaplin, a road carrier with 1,500 horses, to assess the potential traffic flow. He joined the railway, for success seemed certain. The coach companies proved to be frisky opposition, putting doubt in the minds of shareholders. The route would be from the splendid terminus at Nine Elms on the south bank of the Thames to Southampton. Weybridge cutting presented one of the few major engineering problems. Stevenson speculated that the whole wealth and strength of the company would be forever buried in the cutting through St George's Hill. New confidence resulted from the appointment of Joseph Locke as engineer. On the 21st of May, 1838, the railway opened to Woking Common. Four 220 locomotives were supplied by Berry and Company for use on the line. Lark, Hawk, Raven and Falcon. In September, an extension to Shapley Heath, Winchfield, was opened. Winchfield, 38 and a half miles from Nine Elms, would remain a terminus for just over eight months. During this period, nearly 8,000 passengers used the London and Southampton Railway every week. Road coaches were connecting with trains. In 1988, Network South East celebrated the 150th anniversary of the station with the reenactment of the stagecoach connection. Despite its location in the middle of nowhere, Shapley Heath became an important staging point for travellers en route to or from the west. It was the deep cutting just to the west of Winchfield which had slowed progress. A merchant navy heads for Waterloo. This stretch of line was opened on the 10th of June 1839. The eight mile line to Basingstoke and the 12 and a half mile Southampton to Winchester section were opened simultaneously. The intermediate section opened nearly a year later. This 18 and a quarter mile stretch of line proved to be the most difficult to conquer. The railway building six short tunnels. The original terminus building survives in Southampton, although it closed to passengers in 1966. In 1842, the L&S opened a branch from Bishopstoke, Eastleigh, to Gosport. A terminus was built to serve Portsmouth via a ferry. It signalled the end of the line for the London and Southampton Railway. The London and South Western Railway was born, the residents of Portsmouth disliking the name of a rival port in the railway's title. In 1848, the LSWR extended east from Nine Elms to a new terminus at Waterloo. Five years earlier, Elk achieved over 50 miles an hour, the line boasting the fastest trains in the world. Locomotive developments had led to the purchase of two two twos, which were found to be considerably more stable. Some locomotives were bought in at this stage, but others, such as Styx, were built at Nine Elms. Nine Elms Works had been commissioned after John Gooch had taken over the locomotive department from Joseph Woods. Two generations of Beatty, Joseph and William, were in charge from 1850. The suburban well tanks are among the best known Beatty designs. On December the 2nd, 1962, a pair of rebuilt Beatty well tanks returned to Waterloo where they had started their careers in the mid-1870s. The three surviving members of the class had returned from exile on the Bodmin and Wadebridge line to work the Southwestern Suburban Rail Tour. The 88-year-old veterans departed for Hampton Court at 11 a.m. The tour was oversubscribed and the repeat performance two weeks later actually raced the Atlantic Coast Express from Waterloo. A fitting end for a classic class. 
William Adams took over from Beatty Jr. in 1878. He was responsible for 524 locomotives during his 17 years with the LSWR. Dougald Drummond took the Southwestern into the 20th century. An L12 stands at Waterloo. 440s were again favored, the earlier K10 post-dating the more numerous T9s. In 1912, Dougal Drummond died in office and his position was taken up by Robert Urey. A Urey N15 arrives. Drummond had experimented with 460s, but it was Urey who was more successful with the type. Under Maunsell, N15 production continued. This was one of 30 built by the North British Locomotive Works. In the suburbs, the Southern continued with LSWR electrification practice. 600 volts DC supplied from a third rail. Its expansion helped to win back lost trade from the new electric trams. By the 30s, the Southern was beginning to realize the potential of holiday traffic to the West Country. All the latest fashions are on display at Sidmouth. The Southern was carrying more passengers in the summer than the other three companies put together. It was the gateway to sunshine. It wasn't until the war that the Southampton line became the premier route. This sequence was recorded in 1946 or 47. Sir Carl Grevance prepares to take out a Bournemouth line train from Waterloo. The scene is reminiscent of the famous poster, Summer Comes Soonest in the South. The livery was introduced from 1941. In an effort to save money, less malachite was used and the gilt lettering was replaced by the yellow sunshine style. CME Oliver Bullitt steered the Southern Railway through the war and had actually built the merchant navies during the austerity period. The light Pacifics, such as Exmouth, were introduced from 1945. They were the last southern engines. Nationalization came in 1948. Nine Elms was for 130 years at the heart of southwestern operations. The passenger terminus, locomotive, carriage and wagon works, locomotive running shed and goods yards had all disappeared by 1968. New Covent Garden Market now occupies the site of the running shed. The fruit which once arrived by rail now comes by road. The depot was located just two miles from Waterloo, between Queen's Road and Vauxhall. Extensive goods yards existed on both sides of the line. For decades, 70A Nine Elms Depot appeared almost derelict. One of the best known footplatemen from the shed is Bert Hooker, former fireman in the 1948 locomotive exchanges. My father was a driver on the railway, working as a motorman at Dartford and Slakery. And he came home one day in 1934 and he said they're taking on cleaners, Albert. They'd put the word out among the drivers that they were going to take on cleaners because the, hardly anyone had ever had been taken on in a footplate line of promotion since about 1921 just the odd one here and there. And in 1934, they took on six cleaners at each London depot. And I was fortunate enough to, to get in at New Cross Gate as the fifth one. The war started in 1939 and immediately there was an uprush of work. And then a vacancy list appeared, which uh, common knowledge said that that's the last one until the end of the war. And uh, I put in for nine elms and uh, got it. And one of the drivers said to me, what are you going round Nine Elms for, Bert? He said, the fireboxes round there are 14 feet long. But I never regretted going there. It was a marvellous depot. We went over Nine Elms Good Yard on my first morning and we boarded this little G6 tank that I was booked with an old boy named Walter Stone. Funny injectors and whatnot, but Walter showed me how to, to operate them. Then we moved and we made it start shunting, see? So Walter pulled up, he said, Wall, I said, we'll put the brake on. He said, that's your job. It was a handbrake shunter. I was more surprised than anything that the mainline depot line at Nine Elms still had handbrake shunting in Nine Elms Goodyard.
X9 Elms driver Clive Groom is still active on the footplate. He prepares 257 Squadron for one of his regular driving courses on the Swanage Railway. I started at Norwood, uh, which was a goods depot on the LBSC section of the old Southern Railway. At Norwood I was in, uh, I think, the third gang up when I left and we were still doing things like uh, pick up goods, trips to West London with the W's. Some of the trips took us to Wimbledon and while we were at Wimbledon I'd see the Lord Nelsons, the King Arthurs, the Merchant Navies, the West Countries streaking through and I thought well I don't think I'm going to be satisfied with goods work all my life uh, and that's why I transferred. It still took a long time, I still had to go through the goods links, the empty stock working links, uh, but eventually I got into number three, uh, which was called the Tavy Gang in those days because it used to run the goods train to Mary Tavy. Uh, the opening was what was called an accommodation transfer. What I did, I claimed that my house was nearer Nine Elms than it was to Norwood, which was not true at all, and uh, that as a result of that, and because of the shift work, uh, I needed to transfer to, to Nine Elms. Eventually I ended up on the main line. I often fired to Bert Hooker, because old Bert was a past fireman at the time. The workings in his link didn't extend uh, very far down the line, but if he changed over with a senior driver, then he could get more and longer runs. My regular mate, Jim Dawson, was very bronchial and especially in the winter the night work turns the 1240 goods out of Nine Elms to Basingstoke uh, used to crease him up pretty badly the fog he could hardly breathe and Bert would change with him so that Jim would do Bert's diesel shunter in Nine Elms yard and Bert would do Jim's running turn it was the first good strain I worked from Nine Elms was from Felton to Nine Elms yard with an S15 one or two trains left for Feltham midday, but otherwise uh, everything was geared to uh, making up trains for the evening rush. You know, there was a 7.15 to the docks in the evening, then there was the Tavy to be made up, and the Dorset goods. They were all important work for night time. In the mornings, uh, in the small hours, the up traffic began to come in. The, uh, Dorset goods, and the tavy and the meat all came in. The milk would uh, go up to Vauxhall to be unloaded, two trains a day. One left about one o'clock in the morning and uh, stood at Vauxhall until about six. 3,000 gallons of milk in the tanks at Vauxhall. You can pop along with a tea can and Ask the uh, chap in charge there, can I have a drop of milk? And he'd, he'd give you a drop of milk out of that, and you could stand a spoon up in it. It was cream, beautiful stuff, made lovely coffee. And another train uh, went up about 10 o'clock in the morning, which uh, we usually finished about 2 or 3 in the afternoon, but when the tanks were emptied and the train was then taken to Waterloo and then the turnover engine provided to take the empties back to Clapham, the Clapton Junction, Kenny side, the whole lot would go away to uh, Salisbury or Devon again for reloading. Yeah, the empty trains were run mainly by M7s in, in my early days and, and they were run by a group of drivers in what was called the tank gang. Now these drivers were sometimes main line men who no longer wanted the stress and strain and the odd hours of working down the main line because it's not really an older man's job and they would elect to come off the main line and go in the tank line and finish out the last three or four or five years of their life working empty to Waterloo. It was a nice steady little number and you ended up at Waterloo with usually 20 minutes uh, sitting on the buffers at the back of the train. You could watch the crowds, read the newspapers, it was a nice sort of existence for a man who'd done his time on the main line, had his glory and didn't want any more of it. They were booked nine minutes from Clapham Yard to Waterloo. Impossible timing, really, you know, with about 12 or 13 bogeys on. It'd take you three minutes to get out the yard. And the time you got up to Queen's Road, you, you was only beginning to get a bit of a speed on, up to 30 miles an hour. Then you got Vauxhall Bank facing you. <laughs> so uh, usually, uh, 
it was 11 or 12 minutes by the time you came to rest in Waterloo, but no one ever got a ticket as far as I'm aware. It wasn't that critical. Good job it wasn't. <laughs> about the only engine that would run up there in nine minutes would be the pannier tanks. They'd do it, but of course using about twice as much water and steam and coal as one of them seven would. Empties were also run using these engines when they came off the front of a passenger train. They didn't go straight to Loco. They very often worked a set of empties to Clapham, then went to Loco. So even though you were in a gang that was working uh, to prepare and dispose engines, you might, in the same turn, run sets of empties between Waterloo and Clapham. The art then was to do it without putting too much coal on the fire. You'd run with a fire like that. So that when you got to the shed, it wasn't much fire to throw out. You didn't build a massive great fire. The shunting at Clapham on the west of England trains was very, very complicated. They had to reverse the setting of the whole train because it was in portions. And the train had to be reversed carriage by carriage from the time it arrived at Clapham to the time of the next train departing for the West Country. So what they did there, and it was the only place that I know of that allowed it, they would pull the strings on the whole train and they would knock them off like wagons. And they, were, they were experts, those uh, Clapham shunters, absolute experts, and they would never have been allowed to do it if they weren't. But they actually loose shunted coaching stock in order to get the trains sorted that they had to in, in the 24 hours. And that was very interesting work for a young driver. Drivers develop their skills through all these little paths of having to judge weight, distance, speed from shunting engines in the shed, wagons in a goods yard, coaches in a carriage yard and so on. By the time you get up to driving a mainline engine in, under the old system, there was nothing to surprise you anymore. You'd had all your nasty shocks, you'd had all your sudden collisions and locked wheels and all the rest of it uh, and that was the training system we had. Each class of engine was different. You couldn't apply one thing to one class and uh, expect it to work on the other. If you had a, a Monster Well 1, which I hadn't got a lot of experience, then you needed a flat fire, a flat grate. They used them parcels, especially at Christmas time when the parcels traffic you know, became quite heavy when they finished with them on the eastern section and they came over the Nine Elms and put in store and occasionally they would dig one out and put the fire in them and use her. The T9s were all right on the run, you know, but they, they weren't too good on the, you know, on the stopping service unless of course you only had two or three on. They did try her on the 5.9 at Basingstoke, you know, when they did get her out to give her a run. But she was all right getting the woking, and then thereafter, like, she lost a bit of time because uh, acceleration was a bit on the slow side. Ran at lenses. I once, as a driver, did 75 miles an hour uh, to woking with an S15. That was towards the end of steam. Standards have, had supplanted the S15s on most of those stopping trains. But on this occasion, we had this S15. A passenger came up to me and said, are you going to time it with this? And I said, yeah, we will, providing it doesn't prime. That is, to pick up the water with the steam. He didn't prime. And we got up to 75 miles an hour before we got the rope. And we actually knocked two minutes off the timing. Those engines, and King Arthur's are the same, uh, there's so much vibration on the foot plate and the tender, if it's a tall slack, shunts up against the engine like that. And the coal would be going whoop, whoop, whoop on, the t on the tender. The tender, the bed of the tender would be would be bouncing, and the coal would come over the top and onto the foot plate, and it would drop off the sides. And in the end, there's a river of coal crossing the floor up to the boiler where it has to stop, and then it gradually deepens until you get six inches or a foot of coal on the foot plate. Don't sweep up yet, mate. It's not up to my ankles. It comes on the footplate faster than you can shovel it into the firebox. And you would end up standing on that level of coal. When you got to Waterloo, you couldn't open those doors because the coal would stop you from opening the doors. And you had to shovel the coal that was on the footplate back into the tender before you could get off the engine. And that's what a King Arthur or an S15 or an H15 was like on the main line. The Nelsons were superb engines in the hands of people that knew them. They were an engineman's engine. It's a sort of engine that you had to be absolutely top class to work. 
there were only 16 of them and the number of times that you worked one in a month was probably only one week in a month, you know, once these things came out. And it would only be the top link crews that would have them. It was just a matter of course, they, worked, they weren't worked in any other position but full open. And then say 25% cut off. It's just that the firemen couldn't keep up with anything else under those conditions. I mean, Bert Hooker would probably keep up with it, but I've heard Bert talk about many a rough trip on the Nelson where the, where the thing has been, really caused him problems. And he's told me of all sorts of scheming and wangling that he's had to do to keep the Nelson going. And he was, I would say, the ultimate fireman. The Nelsons were master of their job. And the King Arthurs would fill in and do it within reason. Well, they were always worked with the lever fairly tight with the reverser fairly well up towards mid-gear and the regulator double. On the first valve, practically nothing happens with the southwestern engine. You've hardly got enough strength to pull the skin off a rice pudding. But once you've got the second valve, they wind themselves up into doing some work. On the King Arthur's, the, the driver at uh, Clutton Junction would step across the footplate and he'd pull the regulator from the middle position where it's open only in the first valve and he'd come over the fireman's side and he'd pull it right open into the second valve at Clapham Junction and that's where it would stay. So Hector Mir was one of the last surviving King Arthurs. Standards and Bullet Pacifics finally displaced the pre-war veterans two years after this scene was taken in 1962. When the merchant navies came along and went into the top blink, there was a, an abundance of power which wasn't used on many occasions. They, they weren't really extended. But in reason, a West Country would do the work that a merchant navy would do. The West Country would have to be extended a bit more, just to open them up a bit. In later years, the Bullet Pacifics were always booked traction on the two prestige trains on the route, the Atlantic Coast Express and the Bournemouth Bell. When you were on the Bell, you were, you were sort of on your best behaviour. You know, uh, no smoke and no blowing off, and you cut that down to a minimum. And of course, they invariably clean the engine. And, uh, now you go up to Waterloo, or you know, clean overalls on, everything all up to date, all spick and span, and but you sort of uh, put your best foot forward, as it was a little bit of publicity, wasn't it, for the railway? It was a Bournemouth turn all the week, but on Sundays it was a nine hours turn, and I remember firing to Bert on the Bournemouth Bell on a Sunday. Photographer Frank Hornby was at Clapham Junction for one of the last runs of the Ace. The late 50s, early 60s was the heyday, I think, of the, of the West Country traffic. In the winter time, it was always 12. Uh, summer Saturdays especially, you're running three or four sections you know, before the Western got hold of it, before people were realising that the withered arm was ready to drop off. 1964, when the Atlantic Coast stopped running, that's when uh, the warships took over. The track was being prepared for 100 mile an hour running towards the end of steam. So we knew that the track was OK for 100 miles an hour. Although our speed limit was 85, we knew that as soon as steam was gone it was going to be 100. I mean 90 was the official speed, but they've got to make it OK for 100. So I suppose that gave you some confidence. And my attitude was always that I would run up to the official limit and I would make up time wherever I could within the official limit. And that was my way of driving with the perhaps one or two exceptions towards the very end of steam. And I did have a crack at 100 miles an hour. I was a fair old stickler for 85 miles an hour. When I had uh, Mallard on that special from Waterloo to Salisbury in, in February 1963, we were having a good run. 
happens we are approaching Andover and the LNER inspector said what's your road speed Bert and I said uh, 85 he said she's doing 93 oh I said that speed on it is wrong George but when we learned afterwards it was dead accurate because that we were timed through Andover at 93 in the 1960s, numerous former LNER engines visited the Southwestern on rail tour duty. Even the Great Marquis and Flying Scotsman, which were booked to go down the Brighton line, were prepared at Nine Elms. 4472 works light engine between Nine Elms and Victoria. During the 60s, four A4s visited the Southwestern, but one of the most remarkable tours was run by the LCGB. Blue Peter was tripped from Scotland for the one-off tour. Clive Groom was the driver when the A2 visited Nine Elms for the trip to Exeter. That was a great pleasure and a great disappointment all in one. I'd uh, ridden on the engines with Bill Hall. I knew that the Northeastern engines were, were wonderful machines, but that particular engine was worn out at the time. It had a tender full of our very best uh, bug dust and uh, the center cylinder cox wouldn't shut. I had a choice of failing the engine because the cylinder cox wouldn't shut or taking it. Well, I think I would have got lynched if I'd failed the engine and turned up at Waterloo with a merchant navy instead of the A A2. So I took it and we had a hell of a trip to Salisbury, but at the end of it all, we, uh, my fireman and I were both very black and, and very fed up and very disappointed. And we'd like to have given a, a better run to the people in the train. The, the chaps that relieved us, the crew that relieved us at Salisbury, had even worse luck than us. The fire was even dirtier than it started off by the time they took over, 83 miles later, and those poor chaps actually stuck on Honiton Bank. Nine Elms Depot would close with the end of steam on the 9th of July, 1967. It was the last BR steamshed in London. In its last few months, Nine Elms became a mecca for photographers and artists. David Shepherd. During the day, I'd be painting elephants or rhinos or whatever <laughs> for people who were buying my pictures. And in the evenings, I would rush out, if I ever had a spare evening, into Guildford Steamsheds, which was the nearest shed to where I lived in Surrey, or Nine Elms in London with my canvas and my Land Rover, I'd bung it all in the back of the Land Rover and charge into the steam shed, never bothered about permits. They all loved me anyway, they all knew me and they said, oh, they used to move engines around for me especially. And I'd desperately try to record something of the last dying moments of steam onto canvas. I've still got the canvases, no money in the world could buy them because they were authentic, they were rush sketches, thumbnail sketches if you like, um, authentically done. Uh, some of them only took 20 minutes, only had 20 minutes because they probably moved the engine away on a ballast train or something to Woking or something, you know. Sorry, mate, we've got to take her out. Um, so that van goes another canvas, but it was all valuable stuff. The shed was bombed several times. The shed roof was never replaced. So the old shed always had, uh, was always the shed without a roof. You always signed on an hour before you left the shed. You were allowed exactly an hour, or with a Merchant Navy or a Lord Nelson, an hour and a quarter to oil the engine up and prepare it. So you signed on at, say, 8.58. At 9.58, you were due to leave the shed. With the engine cold up, sands filled, oil lamps filled and lit and put on, coal trimmed, water filled up in the bunker, brake tested, injectors tested, fire made up with about a tonne of coal in it, foot plates swept, yourself washed, cup of tea made, and away you went. You all knew what time you were supposed to leave, so you just followed each other up towards the exit dummy. As you approached the exit dummy, the uh, pointsman in his hut would ring up the junction signal box, and he'd say, such and such an engine waiting to leave. Well, when the uh, loco had the engine ready, I'd put it up behind the train. If I could, behind the train, it takes out, but uh, sometimes I couldn't. But this is a describer in the uh, describer, engine for Bournemouth, or West of England, and then we'd on our schedule know what, what it was for, and then bring it up and uh, be on his train. Outside Waterloo, you'd stop, and the first engine would hook off and go on to his train. <laughs> 
points would change, second engine would hook off, go on to his train, and so on. And you'd all go off onto your relative train. Summer Saturdays, as a rule, was the only time that engines went up in pairs. And, and then that was only at the signalman's request. You always carried the head code of the train you were booked to work. Well, all the platforms were um, booked down on the, the schedule. I mean, uh, if you roll with the platform, you have to tell, like, tell quite a lot of people. Otherwise, you'd be waiting in the wrong place. Uh, post office staff and uh, platform staff, there's 309 miniature levers and water levers. And it was split up with the like, um, main line and Windsor side. It wasn't no, nothing over. Well, during the day, there was uh, five on, on at a time, two at night. There's one on the local, on the local frame. There was one, what they used to call sticky corner, which was box all end the main line frame and then you had the main line man in the middle that was the three and you had two on the windsor side that was the five and then you had the regulator on the on the table the regulator. you had the plunger down at the uh, on, the, on the platform when it was ready they used to plunge it and you get the light in the box it was ready to start the instruction at waterloo was that the engine that pulled the engines in had to propel the train out in order to clear the station quickly on the upgrade well, they used to ring the train out when it was ready. When you got to the bin after the time it should go, you pull the signal off, and uh, the trainer would start with the engine at the back pushing. You push it back three quarters away out the platform, then let go. And the train would carry on, and then you'd stop on the top of the platform. And then you'd run it out separate. As soon as the last coach had cleared the, the track, you'd either go in the dock or perhaps it would go down to Nine Elms. Those signalmen were among the highest class signalmen employed on the British Railways because they had to knit those engines in across the main line without delaying up or down trains and without endangering the public. Over 25 years have elapsed since Nine Elms Depot served Waterloo. The changes have been radical, yet Waterloo is a magnificent and now international terminus. Waterloo Station was the jewel in the crown of the London and South Western Railway. Opened with the Metropolitan Extension from Nine Elms in July 1848, the station was named after a battle fresh in mind. The Victory Arch was added later to commemorate the LSWR employees lost in the First World War. These views are from 1965. Originally, a line ran across the concourse to link with the Southeastern Railway at Waterloo Junction. At the turn of the century, this was the view from A Box. The Windsor lines are on the left, mainline platforms in the middle, and on the right is the separate South Station. Funeral traffic for the Brookwood Necropolis used another small terminus just outside the station. Lord Nelson class Lord Hawk passes beneath a box as it departs on the Atlantic Coast Express. In the early 1960s, it was still possible to record traditional southern motive power at Waterloo. Maunsell Schools Class Epsom, complete with gigantic bullied chimney, releases Sir Brian, a North British-built Arthur. The Glasgow machines were known by footplatemen as Scotchmen. A few years later, unrebuilt West Country 34019 backs onto a Bournemouth train. The Light Pacific has already lost its Biddeford nameplates. Waterloo was originally built with just three platforms. By the turn of the century, 15 platform faces were available. Between 1909 and 1922, a major rebuild was undertaken. It was during this period that electrification commenced. Colour light signalling was installed in 1936, and the all-electric concrete signal box was commissioned. The classic A box was demolished. Biddeford departs. Less than two miles from Waterloo is Vauxhall. A U heads for Basingstoke in the early 60s. A 
An incredible 80 tours were promoted on the Southern or with Southern Steam Pyre during 1966 and 1967. The LCGB Surrey Downsman in March 1967 employed 145 Squadron between Waterloo and Clapham via Staines and Weybridge. After passing Nine Elms, Queen's Road Station is positioned between and beneath the former LBSC South London Line and West End and Crystal Palace Line, both destined for Victoria. A classic view at Clapham Junction. Sidmouth passes beneath Clapham A box on the Windsor Lines. Dartmoor heads for Bournemouth. The severe curves through the platforms at Clapham necessitated a 40 mile an hour speed restriction. A few years earlier, an S15 works an up Basingstoke. 30498 ended its days at Feltham in June 1963 after over one million miles of service. A well-weathered 34093 saunters down from Waterloo. In the previous shot, the roof of A box was protected by corrugated steel roofing, which had been added during the Second World War. In 1965, corrosion resulted in the structure dropping several feet at the north end, and after repair, the excess weight was removed. A standard Class 3 arrives from Kensington off the former West London extension line. Surprisingly, there is no access from the WLER onto the southwestern main line. LSWR trains had to continue via Putney, whereas LBSC trains used the platforms on the south side. Clapham Junction is really an amalgamation of three stations. The same engine arrives from Kensington on the Kenny Bell, the last regular steam-worked suburban passenger service. Just to the west of the station, an up freight occupies the Brighton lines where the southwestern lines diverge. On the 28th of August 1964, Padstow works the 1215 service to Bournemouth. Clapham Cutting was a favourite location for photographers, the engines opening up after the slack through the station. The box was closed in 1936 when colour light signalling was introduced, but it still stood 30 years later. A standard four returns from Basingstoke. The third rail, as far as Swaithling, beyond Eastley, was energised by the end of 1966, but some of the Basingstoke stoppers went DMU before going EMU. A standard Class 5 completes our sequence. At Earlsfield, an L1 works at down parcels. Nine Elms became the end of the line for all 15 of these former Eastern Division locomotives, although they were rarely used. 31786 was the last of the class in action. This location is just to the west of Earlsfield Station. A Western Region interloper heads for Exeter on an evening service on the 18th of June 1967. When the Western took over the Exeter Road, all the steam activity ceased beyond Salisbury. Dansford Road Power Station on the north side of the line was built in 1915 for the first stage of the LSWR's ambitious electrification plan. At the time, and indeed later, the thought of the third rail serving main lines was not under consideration. An EMU depot still exists at Dernsford Road, but there is no longer a power station. The last tower was demolished in February 1965. A major remodelling project was undertaken between Dernsford Road and Wimbledon. Opened in May 1936, this flyover was constructed to avoid delays to mainline services and speed up the approach to Waterloo. The new flyover brought up slow trains to the former down through. The fast and slow routes were effectively now in pairs. The train going over the top is on the up 
local. Alongside the country end of the flyover, the joint BR and London transport route from Putney joins. Southwestern trains on the up, bound for Kensington Olympia, would take this route to gain access to the Windsor Line platforms at Clapham Junction. On the 18th of June 1967, the last Steam Hauled Society special on the Southern heads for Fareham with 73089 and Blackmore Vale. Officially, steam should have been eradicated on this day, but it had become obvious that the late deliveries of EMU stock would give steam a stay of execution. Wimbledon station is literally just around the corner. A standard works it down Basingstoke past A box. Beyond the station, a loading dock once received imported Vespers regularly. B box is in the foreground. A box controlled the line to Tooting and Streatham, B box gave access to Mitcham, and C box was on the junction for the Morden South and Sutton line. This box closed in 1982. 73089 hauls an up train displaying lamps, not discs. On July the 2nd, 1967, BR ran two Farewell to Southern Steam tours. Orient Line returns to Waterloo and Nine Elms after a day out in Weymouth. passes Rains Park on the outward journey to Weymouth. Orient Line performed well, reaching 88 miles an hour on the outward and 90 miles an hour on the return journey. Some compensation for the passengers who had stumped up the premium fare of five pounds. In happier times, Lord Beaverbrook works an up west of England service. The unrebuilt retains a streamlined high-sided tender, complete with the original BR style lining. At the other end of the station, a brush type 4 holds a class 9 passenger. The diesel is in fact working the down Bournemouth bell on the 2nd of July 1967. Amazingly, the bell was discontinued just one week later as steam finished on the southern and the new electric timetable was introduced. Diesels were rostered on the Pullman train from the 2nd of January. However, the occasional steam engine did stand in during the last months. Rains Park is the junction for Epsom. Latford works a down Bournemouth train as a new electro diesel passes on the up. The Sutton Seeds factory was once a familiar landmark. Latford continues west towards the A3 and New Malden on another west of England service. Approaching New Malden from Waterloo is A3 St. Simon on the 25th of August 1963. The rail tour was run by the Southern Counties Touring Society to Weymouth. Looking west from the same overbridge is New Malden Station. Britannias were never common on the southwestern, although they did appear briefly during 1953 alongside V2s when the merchant navies were withdrawn from service with axle problems. Mercury in particular worked several tours on the southern. The burrowing junction at the west end of the station gave access to Kingston. A standard five works a Waterloo to Southampton docks boat train. Eleven miles out from Waterloo is Berryland Station, 
opened in October 1933 to serve the developing residential area. Stopping trains are provided on the Hampton Court service. The up Bournemouth Bell is hauled by Croydon. Sir Eustace Missenden Southern Railway works a down Bournemouth service. Surbiton was one of the original stations on the line, opening as Kingston when the London and Southampton Railway reached Woking Common in 1838. A rebuilt bullet arrives from Waterloo. 602 Squadron flies past on a West of England service. Another West of England down train approaches, hauled by Oakhampton. Fresh ballast on the fast lines suggests recent engineering work. At the other end of the station, standard 573022, complete with homemade smoke box number, arrives on a stopper. Ron Cover, an Eastley diesel fitter, was responsible for at least 14 plates. The shed foreman was also actively encouraging clean engines. Crews could earn another three hours work cleaning up their locomotives. classic southern architecture dating from the rebuild of the 1930s. This coincided with the re-signalling programme and first electrification of a southwestern main line to Portsmouth. Another rebuilt arrives before Tamar Valley departs and we continue west. diverges to the north using a flyover. Alongside the junction, patrons of a miniature railway could watch both miniature and massive railways. Amazingly, the LSWR were constructing the flyover during World War I. Both mainline trains are on the up, viewed from the north side of the line. Hampton Court Junction was something of a reference point for crews on down trains. 18 minutes book time from Waterloo. If you were on time, it was plain sailing from here. Saunton is followed by a schools class approaching Isha. The first few scenes at Isha were recorded by Jeff Rickson during 1960. The schools was working stopper to either Basingstoke or, more likely at this time, Southampton Terminus. Jeff's vehicle deserves a mention, a Heinkel bubble car. On the up is Sir Percival, a Scotch Arthur. In the distance is Isha East Box, which became the most easterly pneumatic signal box after the introduction of colour light signalling towards London. Croydon storms through en route to the West Country. One of the most surprising regular duties in 1966 was the use of a Banbury Black 5 on the 0855 Sundays only Bournemouth to Waterloo and the 2030 return. The Stania engines were introduced on weekday into regional work to pool towards the end of Western Region steam. Bournemouth Depot would simply make good use of the engine over the weekend. From 
1962, the goods yard was taken out of use. On the 30th of April, 1966, W's worked the RCTS Longmore Special past the redundant yard. At the country end of the station, 31639, one of the locomotives seen previously on tour, arrives on a ballast train from Woking. The end came for the 260s in June 1966. By the end of the year, all traditional southern types were withdrawn from service. The Southwestern was a modern steam railway. Blue Funnel passes the Mogul on the up bell just to the east of the station. The U has run round its train and is engaged with engineering work. The ballast duties were among the last workings for the Moguls. Engineering work was a regular weekend activity. The two bill is working down the up main. BR was gradually upgrading the route with long welded rail. The traditional signalling was also doomed. The Isha East box closed in September 1961, but Isha West survived to serve the racecourse platforms which closed in October 1965. An unusual slotted post signal was installed in the summer months only. A standard five works through on the new permanent way. The 1966 and 67 sequences at Isha were recorded by Michael Greaves. Another standard approaches from the west on an up Channel Islands boat train. The disused race platforms are in the foreground. Our final Isha view is of a down Salisbury service. We pass through Hersham on board an EMU during engineering work. The unit is travelling down the up fast. The station has definite similarities to Berrylands. The principal difference is that Hersham survives almost intact. Daylight steam returned in February 1994. <coughs> Two generations of top-link Bournemouth power. The network southeast flagship, the Wessex Electric, contrasts with Tor Valley. The Light Pacific was en route to Yeovil on the first daylight steam working from Waterloo since 1967. On the 2nd of July 1967, Orient Line heads for Weymouth. Steam number one special speeds away from Hersham. Walton on Thames station retains much of its infrastructure. Walton was one of the stations first opened by the London and Southampton Railway. Nine Elms, Wandsworth, Wimbledon, Kingston, later Surbiton, Ditton Marsh, later Esher, Walton, Weybridge, and Woking Common were on the original timetable. We rejoined the Upfast on train. The last King Arthur, Sir Prianius, works the Up Southwestern Limited in 1962. Weybridge cutting precedes the station. This is the down bell. One of the few daylight freights works down the slow before another bullet storms through. for the junction to Addleston. A triangle to the north of the main line is formed by the Addleston Junction to Byfleet Junction spur, which gives access to Addleston for up traffic. Trains from Addleston and Virginia Water for the west would rejoin the main line just to the east of Byfleet and Newhall Station. The last
cast of the unrebuilt Battle of Britain's Biggin Hill works an evening down west of England service. The second coach in this formation is a green Mark II. A merchant navy powers the up Channel Islands Boat Express. A brief interlude courtesy of the 1964 Farnborough Air Show. Our final view at this station is a four-core unit en route to Portsmouth. They were known as Nelsons. The penultimate station in this program is West Byfleet. An interesting track layout, but architecturally it's definitely missing a little something. Passengers can now cross the line via a footbridge. A BEP approaches on the up. We join an up train on the 22nd of April 1967 behind 73065 for a trip through the station. It's perhaps misleading that we are travelling on the up fast, effectively the centre road through the station. The down slow sweeps around behind the platform in this view. Our final archive sequences are at Woking, just over 24 miles from Waterloo. A standard approaches on a down working. When the station opened, it was called Woking Common, for it was one and a half miles from the town. The station was severely remodelled in the 1930s. On the up, a Bournemouth train approaches. 73169 continues west. On the 22nd of January 1967, a pair of unrebuilt Bullet Pacifics, Lapford and Biggin Hill, approach the station on the Bridport Bell. The pair paused briefly before continuing west. Final shot is of Tor Valley on the daylight run from Waterloo on the 19th of February 1994. Look out for Volume 2, Woking, Basingstoke, Winchester, Eastleigh and Southampton.